right, everyone? Time to make a start, hey? So today we are very lucky to have Don McPhail from Ergon Energy here to speak to us about uh, electrical engineering, different strands of electrical engineering and, and his particular roles that he's been through and various other things. So this is your introduction to electrical. As discussed at the beginning of the semester, we're not going to do much more on electrical engineering in this subject, but you have the whole programming subject most of you are doing currently. You have electric circuits next semester. So all of that added together should give you pretty good perspective on what electrical engineering is. All right? But without further ado, I'll hand over to Don and he can... Great. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for having me here. Uh, as Dave mentioned, I work at Ergon Energy. Uh, my role is Network Strategy and Policy Engineer. Um, and uh, yeah, I studied electrical engineering um, at actually the University of Queensland um, and then moved up to Townsville to, uh, for a job with Ergon. Um, so I guess just um, what I was going to do is I was going to go over a bit about uh, what electrical engineering does, where you find electrical engineers in the workforce and that, um, what the opportunities are like out there, um, specifically around the journey I've had to get where I am now. Um, and I guess probably some of the things that are emerging on the horizon for opportunities for electrical engineers, but also how the various different engineering groups I see work together, um, but more, I guess, with an electrical slant on it as well, though. Um, so just to kick things off, I don't know if many people have seen this one before. It's been around for a while, but it's just a little bit of a, I guess, a curse of the engineer. I'm worried about Richard Gilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? So what is electrical engineering? Um, so there's three main streams for electrical engineering. The uh, main ones being power engineering, so um, that's generation, distribution, uh, transmission. Um, there's the electronics and power electronics, so in everything that we use from day to day, um, and increasingly um, everything in the world around us in that as well. Um, and then telecommunications, so I guess telecommunications was one that had a massive push uh, maybe 20 years ago, um, and sort of has been more of a stable um, uh, service for, for the last sort of 10 years, but it's again growing as telecommunications and the internet of things has rolled out across um, all the sort of devices that were kind of done in comparison beforehand. And I guess the um, Engineers Australia sort of, I guess, defi definition of electrical engineering is it's the research, design, development, manufacture, installation, operation, maintenance and management of equipment, plants and systems. Uh, but, I mean, in that term it probably would apply equally to mechanical, um, you know, mechatronics, uh, civil and, and, and the like for a number of different um, types of infrastructure. So, where do electrical engineers work? Um, as I said, there's the, the power generation and there's, I guess, a number of different um, components along the, the cycle there. So, there's the generation, um, so, you know, historical coal power stations, gas power stations, um, hydro, um, wind power, solar. Uh, nuclear, uh, then through to the transmission and that, uh, the distribution which then connects up to the houses, there's um, the sort of smarts that then connect into the house and all that as well. Um, and then an emerging, I guess, more uh, mainstream field now is too, is the all the sort of different electrical appliances that make up the electricity industry but now are embedded within the household. So that's the solar PV and um, the batteries. Uh, there's increased more of, uh, amount of home automation in that around electrical systems. Um, so that's like, I guess, the next system there. Electric vehicles is there, I guess, the shift into transportation, whereas electrical systems beforehand were more electronics in terms of, you know, the way that the car um, drove and stopped and operated and got its efficiencies and that. 
you know, now it's becoming the complete body of how it powers the car, how it gets its, um, its drive, how it accelerates, how it um, brakes and all that as well. And it's becoming, I guess, the mechanical systems being more removed from the, the end user. Um, and then the other part is around, you know, home robotics and all that as well, which is very much emerging into sort of patient care and self-care and that sort of thing. Um, and particularly in countries, uh, Japan is spending big money on, you know, a lot of developments which often spur into um, uh, other sort of, I guess, advancements in other fields based on those sort of um, changes. Um, the other one is the military. The military employs a massive number of, of engineers and actually in many um, countries the engineers are actually a separate corp within the, the military. Um, so both, you know, like the Defence, the Air Force um, and the Navy. Um, and they all do everything from, you know, trying to help with logistics and all that as well, you know, get the bridges in so they can get the forces through, they make sure that you've got electricity um, and water and food and all that sort of stuff being able to connect up through the, the army as they go to, you know, sort of advance or if they're trying to do a peacekeeping mission or if they're trying to do a restoration after, you know, say an earthquake or a, a cyclone or a flood or a tsunami or something. Um, so the engineers, they, they do make a very big part of that workforce. And then the other big one, I guess, particularly from a Queensland sense, is mining. Um, mining has employed a massive number of engineers within Queensland. It's actually probably dictated a lot of the working conditions for engineers within Queensland as well. Um, and so there's a big part of that. And while you know the sort of mining boom has slowed down more recently, that's I guess the boom has been more around the expansion of mining. And so going forward, a lot of that is the maintaining of those existing um, mines that are already in place now that'll continue sort of for 40 to 50 years. Um, mm -hmm. And they still require uh, electrical, mechanical, and um, chemical engineers, and that throughout the life of them. And then the other one is, uh, I guess, rail. Um, so we don't have too much outside of small, freight, I guess, freight rail within Australia, but uh, particularly in Europe and Asia, and that there's a um, massive amount of money that's going into trying to increase the speed that you can move your population around with rail and the opportunities that it holds there. Um, and then I guess we, you know, we have projects here in Australia that are. Um, sort of looking out to 2050 by building a massive um, passenger rail, but also a complete um, unified freight rail system from Brisbane all the way down to Melbourne um, through inland. So there is opportunities there as well. Um, and I guess sort of, I guess just sort of highlighting sort of then the more, I guess, so they're the more traditional ones and sort of highlighting some of the big ones then too is so the, um, say with Boeing, that, um, I don't know if anyone's seen much about the Dreamliner plane that Boeing introduced. Um, it's the same with Airbus and that too, but the amount of, I guess, electronic systems and battery systems and smarts and all that they're now putting into those um, planes is incredible. It's, um, you know, their own little uh, power station and all that inside them. They've got their whole, you know, more sensors than we could ever, you know, see in a single city sort of thing is contained within these planes and that um, all are about in trying to increase the efficiency and the safety of them. Um, you've got... Uh, you know, telecommunications um, and space, so being able to communicate with the space station, being able to observe, you know, um, millions of light years away into the, into the past, I guess, um, to see distant planets and all that as well. You know, all that sort of works on, on uh, the ability to monitor waveforms and the, the reflection of light coming back in. And I guess that sort of space of it um, very much falls within electrical engineering um, because a lot of these sort of, I guess, um, signal processing and all that that you do with room electrical is, is where those skills often lie then too. Um, and then the other one on the sort of side there is that automation around, so, you know, with cars, but everything, and everything is moving more and more from, uh, or it has moved a lot in the last 50 years from very people orientated doing the assembly work to, you know, complete automation of machines, building everything, um, and then obviously the machines themselves need to be designed and manufactured and all as well. Um, but it's obviously a very co complex system, um, but it does have that, you know, the, the opportunities for efficiency and all that there as well. And I guess just that bottom one there is just a highlight of, you know, just all of the vehicle manufacturers, um, you know, that are, I think it's the top 100 vehicle manufacturers or something like that, top 50 must be, um, that, you know, exist around the world too. And obviously all of them are trying to stay, you know, make leaps and bounds. If we think about how much a car has changed from the 70s where, um, you know, we didn't have... Um, we didn't have, uh, we're still using, I guess, um, you know, mechanical uh, braking systems, mechanical um, driving systems and all that sort of stuff. So what I, you know, say the Tesla electric vehicle today where 
the action sends an update through to the Tesla monitoring system every day, and it can do its complete diagnostics of the car. So it almost removes the only reason to go into a mechanic is to get the tyres changed, essentially, because the car is being monitored and all that every night and can do its own diagnostics all there and then. Um, so I guess the opportunities within Australia, um, Globally, there's endless opportunities, and I guess you know, depending on the place that you are, it depends on what the opportunities are. So in Japan, as I was saying, you know, lots of opportunities around robotics and, and vehicle manufacturing and that as well. Um, in Europe, is say in Germany, they lead the world in um, a lot of their control systems and all that as well. You know, if you looked in the power industry, and that, um, every single sort of relay or something like that has probably either been designed and manufactured or designed, or well, the parent company sits in Germany or something as well. They definitely are. An engineering nation, um, and then America has also got a lot of the sort of innovative and cutting edge sort of stuff that they do. But here within Australia, I guess the big ones are, you know, power industry, mining, um, particularly in Queensland, they would make up the biggest employers of electrical engineering. Um, then you've got all the small scale electronics design. So I guess Australia not being, you know, having a high cost of labour and that, and it's you know a large um, geographical area with a quite a small population. A lot of our um, I guess advancements in electronics comes more around the sort of specialist um, designs and that sort of thing. So you think of, you know, like even the cochlear implant being invented in Australia. Um, there's, you know, a lot of work that's been done in creating bionic eyes and the ability to see and all that sort of thing. And I guess that's where Australia sort of initializes in those innovative changes that we can make. We can't compete on the ability to manufacture, you know, mass uh, products and all that sort of thing about where we do, you know, sort of. Um, where we do sort of lead is in those sort of small uh, innovations. And then telecommunications. So telecommunications has had a massive growth in that in the past and it will continue to, you know, with like the MBM being rolled out in that as well. Um, but there's a lot of, I guess there's a lot of opportunity there going into the future as, as I was saying, you know, the internet of things. And actually, you know, JCU has the new degree starting next year, I think it is, called the Bachelor of Engineering Internet of Things. And I think that's the first university that's introduced it, but it is a nod towards you know just how much of an area that of growth that will be over the coming decades. Um, as you sort of take the telecommunications and, and plug it into all of these sort of um, what would be considered dumb devices and dumb infrastructure like before and introduce smarts to them. Um, and obviously that you know really does rest in electrical engineering. The other ones I guess are then across you know um, across the spectrum of industry. So you've got operation, operations and asset management. So that's everything from you know, Coles and Molly's managing their system to uh, a mine having asset management to uh, a large container ship or something like that, or a uh, port or um, a rail yard, all that sort of thing. There's all sorts of, I guess, challenges that go in, in, in that, um, that either engineers as a general can that play a role in, or, you know, electrical specifically as well. Um, product vendors and developers and that as well, so, you know, all those sort of German manufacturers and, more, and American manufacturers and Chinese manufacturers of products and they then have um, you know, people that work locally in Australia that have you know, the SME in that product and help try and sell it to the, um, the industry as well. You've got specialist consultants and um, problem solvers, so particularly with you know, government departments and like outsourcing a lot of their work now, there's a lot of smaller uh, consultants which have great opportunities for, um, particularly for young engineers too, and that's sort of you know, the first 10, years, um, 10 to 20 years out of degree and that and then the, the later engineers, they are closer to retirement to um, you know, to do all those sort of work that the, the, the departments and that can't do in-house. Uh, there's the control system, so, you know, that, that's uh, the SCADA or operational technology, and that's, again, I guess, the ability to see and monitor that infrastructure you have that we have out there. So you can imagine that, particularly with a geographically dispersed area like Australia, it's incredibly important to be able to monitor and see how that network operates, to be able to switch it and control it remotely, um, just because, you know, it would be completely outdated to have people there doing it. Um, but as the complexity increases, you can imagine with, say, Brisbane City's railway network or um, your city and Melbourne's and that as well, trying to get the maximum amount of throughput of customers more like through those those networks, the increasing number of uh, trains, and so you need all that sort of automation and ability to monitor. So that you make sure that two trains don't crash or there isn't a 15 minute delay because of some you know signal error or something like that because it, you know, a, a, Either the crash will it result in you know a catastrophic um, incident, or even the 15-minute delay will probably result in anarchy and the uh, the director being sacked from uh, main roads or something, and from Department of Transport. So um, it's yeah, it's incredibly important. And then the other one is manufacturing. You know, particularly 
um, down south in Victoria and that, although a lot of the car manufacturing has been reduced in the last and continue to be reduced over the next few years as well. And agriculture, so I guess in the past Australia has been you know, one of the leaders of agriculture, um, but we've lost that, I guess, um, position in the more recent years, you know, as countries like Brazil and the like have increased their production and sort of the way that Australia sort of needs to get back on top of that, and I guess particularly with the northern Australian growth, is um, the ability to introduce automation and control and monitoring over our agriculture systems, so both um, livestock and, and for um, uh, the growth of, you know, like whether it's sugar cane or, or bananas, and that's sort of been, there's a lot of opportunities there to optimise those systems um, by introducing, you know, the smarts that come with um, electrical and electronic devices. So, just I guess to give a bit of a background of like where my journey has come as an electrical engineer. So uh, I didn't actually graduate that long ago. I graduated in 2008 from UQ um, with a Bachelor of Engineering. I did a graduate program um, with uh, Ogon Energy. So there's still a number of um, like larger companies that do graduate programs. So you know within government departments, within uh, government corporations, um, as well as um, you know the large engineering firms. And the intent there is that you get a chance to move around over a year or three years, depending on the company, maybe even five years, to see the different aspects of the, of the engineering that the company does, um, so that you can sort of build up the breadth of the, um, the broadness of the skills and that, uh, and then you go into more of the area that you focus on that you're interested in, but at least you sort of, you know, the game with sort of broad practical knowledge in that. Um, and I guess the alternative is, is you go straight into a, um, a particular job and focus on building up that, um, that specialist knowledge over time as well. Um, so the, the Ogon one actually really interests me because um, it was an opportunity to, to see the power industry and, you know, like all the different places that it, it um, supplies and all the different challenges that are associated with it. And then um, after, when I came towards the end of my grad program, there's a scholarship that used to be just offered to UQ, but it's offered to um, all Queensland engineering, uh, electrical engineering graduates that have about three to five years of experience and the intent is to get give you an opportunity to go work and work for two years and get experience in um, a particular area of the electrical supply industry um, and bring that knowledge back to Australia. And they offer it every three years. Um, so I got that and I went and worked in, um, in the UK, the Netherlands and the US. Um, and then I came back and got a job back at Ergon again. Um, and then my focus was on becoming a professional engineer. So going through and doing my chartership through Engineers Australia um, and then getting what's called uh, RPEQ, which is Registered Professional Engineer in Queensland, which is a um, legislative requirement for engineers in, uh, in Queensland. Um, and then now I'm sort of moving into you know, the more, I guess, the next stage of my career, which is getting a senior role in that as well. So, uh, graduate programs. So I'll use my example, but I think it's a good one. And this applies, I guess, across different industries as well. But I think it's something to sort of think about what the next stage of your career holds after university. Um, if you go and, if you go straight from a bachelor's degree, but obviously if you go into there's other opportunities in, um, in the academic world too in terms of going into masters and PhD in that as well, uh, and, and becoming a researcher too. We all know that as well. Um, but within the graduate program, so the intent there is, like I was saying, you get that sort of breadth of knowledge. Um, you, you know, you're working with common graduates, and you have a manager throughout, and you usually get a mentor that will stay with you through the life of the program to help build up your both your perfect, I guess your engineering skills, but your interpersonal skills as well. Um, for me, I went through and did, you know, within the power industry, there's, it sort of seems like it's one industry, but there's so many different facets of it. So there's the protection system that is not actually responsible for getting electricity around anywhere, but it makes sure that the system stays um, safe so that it protects itself if there's, you know, a lightning strike or a car crash into a car pole or a road flies into a transformer, um, that the system minimises the amount of damage to itself. At the same time, if um, yeah, a car did crash into the thing, you know, that the power line trips off and it doesn't result in you know, a kid walking by and grabbing the power line and getting electrocuted. So there's you know, a lot of challenges there. There's the planning um, element that I did. So you know, an infrastructure which is critical to ensuring that the lights doesn't go out and is able to keep up with the growth of the, uh, the nation and that um, you know, you're sort of always planning sort of that three to five years out to make sure that you know, you've got long lead time of being able to build these things. It's not like you can just buy it off the shop and plug it in. Um, so you've got to be able to make sure that you're able to plan in advance and, and, and build that infrastructure going forward. And um, obviously that's a challenge with everything from roads to hospitals to agriculture. The difference being, say, with uh, roads, you know, when it doesn't keep up, you have, um, you, have, uh, you have all the cars sort of piled up during the peak hour and that sort of thing. But in the electricity industry, you don't really have that opportunity. If you can't supply the amount of load that's on at the time the car goes out, 
it, it just fails as a system, I guess. So you don't have that opportunity to have um, to have uh, you know cars pulled up on the streets sort of. Thing. Um, and so then, yeah, like I worked in com communication and control systems. I worked then in also in the field as well. So I did six months working with the guys in the field that build, um, augment, or de uh, decommission the, the substations. Um, and then after that, I went into the um, alternative energy space, which was the connection of customer solar PV to the network. And um, that led into me doing going overseas, which I'll sort of touch on. But so when I went overseas, I worked for. Um, in the UK, I worked for UK Power Networks, which is the distributor for London. Uh, and then, uh, so their focus there was on, I guess, transforming this, you know, an infrastructure that's sort of one of the original electrical networks in the world um, and very much underground. But, I mean, they had the challenge where their drawings were done, you know, over 100 years ago and that's the thing. So when they'd want to go do work on an underground cable, all they knew is it's on this side of the street and we don't know where it is, so they'd have to dig up the entire footpath and maybe part of the road to try and find where their underground cables and that went. Um, so they had all sorts of challenges in terms of being able to do, you know, try and bring these smarts to quite an old electrical network, but a very, um, a very critical one because it supplies, you know, one of the biggest, the world's biggest um, financial uh, markets in the world as well. And then went and worked in the Netherlands, um, which was in a consultancy. And so the Netherlands has a lot of opportunities where they uh, get a lot of funding through the EU to do um, quite innovative sort of. Um, consultancy work, so where Germany focuses on products and that sort of thing, and the technical breakthroughs, the Netherlands is more focused towards, um, I guess, the smarts of being able to plan better, being able to look at what you know, those products do and how you integrate them and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, and then I went to the US and worked um, on electric vehicle infrastructure, so uh, the US government previously put, I think it was $150 million up to roll out an LED network. Um, and at the time, Ecotality, who I worked for, managed the largest um, EV infrastructure in the world. And I guess, you know, while EVs haven't really taken off in Australia, and there's probably there's a number of reasons associated with that, um, in the US, for instance, in Phoenix, where I live, which is, you know, it's in the, uh, the middle of the desert, just near Mexico, um, they had over 500 charging stations, public charging stations in the city alone. And I think it's, it's about the sixth largest city um, in the US, but you know, by no means is it a, a liberal city or something or part of California or something like that. It's still very much a, a cowboy state. Um, so, uh, you know, even in those sort of areas, it was being quite progressive in the EV space, which was interesting to see, to sort of think about those opportunities and challenges, that, how they relate back to Australia. Um, so then when I came back, um, as I was saying, my focus on CP engine and, and RPQ. So when, um, I guess as, I'm hoping that everyone here is that Engineers Australia member as a student. So as a student, you get free membership for Engineers Australia. Um, and Engineers Australia does the job of, um, you know, in order for an engineering degree to be recognised worldwide, um, Engineers Australia goes through and, uh, I think it's once every three or five years, goes through and validates that the degree meets the, um, you know, the requirements that are set out in the international reports. Um, but once you graduate, they then have this opportunity, you have an opportunity to then maintain being a member and they help you walk towards your chartership. Um, and the chartership is, I guess, the journey of sort of becoming a professional engineer and being a you know, capable engineer. Um, and so then within Queensland, though, which is the only state in Australia that has it, um, there's actually a legislative requirement to be a registered professional engineer um, in order to be able to work. So that includes both people that work in, in Queensland, but also people from other states that do work in, for Queensland. Um, so, I mean, that puts a lot of uh, responsibility on the engineer in terms of you know, the one that signs up and designs and sign up and you work and that sort of thing. Um, and obviously puts you in a sort of a legal, um, you know, it, you're sort of held responsible for all that work and that. Um, uh, but it also ensures, you know, the integrity and the professionalism of the um, profession within Queensland. Um, and so for me, so I worked towards that and then the next sort of, I guess, parts have been working towards, I was um, program managing a energy sense community. So this was, I guess, for the, the next stage of um, the electrical uh, network. Um, so the challenge for the electricity network, I mean, as I was saying before, it's, you know, it's an old network. Not much has really changed in the 100 years since the electricity networks were progressively rolled out across the world. Um, so it's, just, it's really basic, there's just a lot of copper and you just connect um, a rotating machine through copper and through a light bulb, so there's not much going on there. But um, the change has been, you know, the introduction of 
um, intelligence or smarts through that network, so that introduction of telecommunications and all that overlaying over the network to be able to see and to monitor and to control um, to increase the efficiency of what you've got, but also customer behaviours changing. So you think about, you know, um, like even, even just in the short time that I was, you know, at university, and I remember no one having a laptop and went in class, and even I remember having a, a student in my class that had like a tablet, it was massive though, but um, the lecture was stopping and just, you know, the whole class came around just to see this, you know, brick of a tablet and they got from some, you know, his dad was some important person in the American Defence Force and that sort of thing. Um, and it was just, yeah, that was the whole lecture then, was just focusing on what this tablet could do and the, the possibilities for these, um, these thyristors and all sort of stuff becoming smaller and smaller. But, you know, it just shows, like, in a very short amount of time, like, how you think about how your behaviours have changed, but how, like, you know, the students sitting here five years, ten years, and that ago have changed. You think about the things that have changed within your household, um, you know, how fridges have got smarter, how the washing machines got smarter, how, you know, there's multiple computers and they're not actually desktops now, everyone's using laptops or tablets or their phone and that sort of thing. Um, and at the same time, like within the electricity industry, we've gone from being quite cheap to, you know, a lot of new infrastructure, infrastructure being put in that the price of copper going up to, which increases the cost of supply in that too. But, you know, people becoming more aware of their, the cost of electricity because it is a bigger part of their bill, a bit, sorry, a bigger part of their disposable income. And at the same time, we've got, you know, solar PV that's gone from being something that was so expensive it was just used um, in international space stations because you, know, you couldn't ship coal up there, um, to being so affordable that, you know, one in five homes has one in, the, in Queensland. Um, and, uh, you know, people say that, you know, get in and they're paying power bill and that again. And now we're sort of seeing, if you haven't seen already, I would encourage you to look up uh, the Tes Tesla Power Wall. So it's a battery system that's, you know, it's nothing too innovative about it in terms of battery system, but it's something that will, you know, it's very affordable and it's sort of that next step towards people now putting in battery systems in the line as well, and particularly people with PV seeing what's the next step for them. Um, so these are all, you know, representative of how technology and then the customer behaviours associated with it is changing the way that people use electricity. And that obviously has a way, it means that the electricity industry has to change in how they supply these customers. Um, so that's, you know, that's been a big focus of, I guess, this program that I was managing, but, you know, now my work in that as well. Um, and sort of the challenges for us is how, you know, how we connect these individual customers with solar PV. It brings all sort of um, network challenges. So beforehand, I think I have this in the next slide, actually. Yeah, so this is probably the biggest challenge for the electricity industry is that beforehand, the electricity all ran from one direction. You had big centralised power stations. I mean, the closest one to here being Gladstone. Um, running through a transmission network, which is the big um, lattice towers that you see, through to a substation, then step down to another voltage, which then runs through the poles and wires down the streets, and then eventually to the house. But it all went one direction. It was very stable and unchanging. And then, you know, with the introduction of um, customers with the ability to generate for themselves or to um, store energy and use it themselves, um, you know, that started to change the mix, and then the customers wanted to be able to export that energy back out to the grid. You know, the power starting to flow in the opposite direction, which means we have changes to the way uh, the voltage um, fluctuates in that as well. So now instead of, you know, low pulling down voltage, energy being exported starts to lift up the voltage, and that introduces some challenges for us. We've got, uh, you know, these smart devices and these inverters connecting, which have introduced their own, um, you know, issues to the network, but also, um, how do you safely connect them? How do you know when a power line falls down and the protection system that's designed to trip off the power to be safe so that you know you can go out and touch it or a fireman can put out a fire at a house or something by turning the power? How do you know the power is off now when you've got the generator sitting on the roof of the house of the, of the customer? Um, so there's all those sort of safety issues that have to be managed. At the same time, um, you know, energy's been based, it's the sale of energy through the network's been based off customer throughput, and so customer buying that energy, or you, you, know, you and I buying that energy uh, through electricity bills. But as customers use less and less electricity, the cost of the infrastructure doesn't go down, the cost is still there, and the cost is recovered over the life of the asset would be 40 years, say. Um, which means you've got less energy going through, but you've got the same amount of money in the cover, so it pushes the price of electricity up. So then customers use less energy because the price of electricity goes up. So the price has to go up more because you've got less and less energy. And so they call this the death spiral because as you know, you constantly have to put price of electricity up and more customers use less and less energy. And so the ultimate, I guess, outcome of that is that the, the system as it is dies um, and you know, 
we're all left as a society um, kind of being wiped off because we're paying more for energy than what we would have, even if that is with a solar PV system, or you've got customers that are, um, are uh, you know, fi financially, you know, can't afford that or financial hardship and that, and so they're left with, you know, this system is that's very, very expensive. So the challenge for the industry and the challenge for, you know, the distributors, for the retailers and that, is how do we prevent that from happening and how do we ensure that the, the cost of electricity stays as affordable as possible, that you know, these companies stay relevant as possible, but the government as well ensures that so, um, from a social perspective, we, you know, we have the best sort of outcome um, in the same way that we manage healthcare and those sort of things. Um, and so, I mean, this is where the opportunity then lies for us. So um, from a, a network business, you know, there's a sort of, a, I guess, say, you know, like you can't beat them, join them sort of thing. So, uh, there's the opportunity for the networks to start putting in batteries and that, which means you know it becomes another fundamental part of the network as opposed to building another power line. Can we avoid doing that? Can we put a battery system in, into that area instead of having to reinforce the network and use that to help supply energy locally um, based on households generating their own PV? Um, we've got smarter devices which are sort of dynamic in their usage in terms of um, stack comms and, um, and sort of fax type devices which manage the flow of real and reactive power. Um, so I don't know if you've got to that level yet within the degree, but I guess um, within, I guess, power, you know, you have DC power that we get from, you know, batteries and you know, all batteries and that thing, but you have AC power which gets from your socket. And there's a thing called real power, which, you know, if you had a beer, it would be the actual drinkable part. And then reactive power would be the froth on top, which you can't actually, you know, drink, but it somehow serves a purpose in that. Um, and these things help manage the, the, I guess, the quality of the power that's going through and help manage it within the limits that we have to work. Um, so there's all sorts of, I guess, different and emerging devices that, you know, that we're trialling and piloting and then being able to implement in that as well, um, which means, you know, manufacturers and, and consultants and other are trying to think up the idea how they take these sort of systems creatively into something that works and then bring it down to the size that fits the network and then is able to withstand, you know, 40 degrees and cyclones and um, all sorts of the weather conditions and that that they don't have in the, in the lab, um, so that they can be a practical device and then stand in the field for you know 20 years without anyone having to come by and touch them and that sort of thing. Um, so there's all these sort of challenges, I guess, that you know the different parts are working on to try and introduce. And then the other part is electric vehicles. So I sort of had mentioned it before, but you know today the the, the transportation industry is being you know completely powered by. Um, you know, an independent energy source, so whether that's oil or gas. Um, and so the transition of that then being connected to the electricity industry and the electricity industry supplying that introduced another challenge as well, but also an opportunity, because you have a chance to, um, you know, something coming on that you haven't, haven't got a historical issue for that you can plan for. Um, and there's, you know, you've got the thing where at the moment the batteries uh, or the vehicles are limited by the size of the batteries and how far they can travel. Um, and how much energy those batteries can store. Um, so it means that if you, know, if you can't achieve the same levels as what a conventional vehicle can or a conventional um, internal combustion engine can, uh, then you need you know, a different type of infrastructure to supply that. So that's you know, each household becoming its own fuel station essentially by having a charging point, as well as you know, having them at the shops or having them at the park or having them you know, um, at the strand here as well. Um, or at the airport or wherever it may be so that you can still get the charge and manage your, you know, your behaviours around it. Um, but at the same time, it you know, presents an opportunity to have you know, a lower cost of being able to drive everywhere and that as well. Um, and actually, that's one where I would actually, again, going back to uh, like the Tesla Powerwall, I would also look, encourage people to have a look at the Tesla um, vehicle down in Zimbabwe. There's actually one in towns or that uh, a surgeon at the Mata Hospital I expect that you, you might see zipping around. But, it's essentially a sports car that is completely electric powered. And it goes from zero to 100 in about 3.2 seconds, I think it is. Um, so it has a massive amount of power um, to wheel ratio. And um, you know, this car has all of the luxuries and all of the you know, creature comforts in that. It used to be a roadster version originally, and now they've gone for more of a sort of, I guess, high-end sedan type version. They've got a four-wheel drive type version coming out as well um, in the States. But, you know, these are, I guess, massive innovations in the car in itself, but even in the way that they sell them. So instead of going through, um, through wholesalers and that sort of thing to sell a car, they, Tesla sells the vehicle directly to the customer. They have a shop, which is more like a, a shoe store or something like that. They have a car sitting in there and that, and you just sort of come in and, 
you know, have a conversation and, and buy this Tesla car sort of thing, but obviously not cheap, you know, we're talking about um, in Australia, I think it's about, I think the Roadsters were about 200 grand, but the sedans are now about 100 grand, so we're not talking about a cheap car, um, but it is a, definitely a sort of an, a, a game-changing sort of um, a concept in that as well. Which then flows on to sort of like these uh, Mitsubishi IMEMs that are in the bottom corner there. I mean, they're much like a smart car, like the little um, beat up smart car. Again, like, you know, still quite expensive. I think in Australia they were about 45,000, whereas in the US they were about 20,000. Um, so obviously we've got some issues with the way that we, we price vehicles in Australia that, um, that limits their uptake. But in, uh, yeah, in the US, for instance, they've got you know, about 12 different vehicles they can choose from and they're all within that sort of. Twenty to thirty thousand dollar range, um, which gives them, you know, a, a real, um, you know, a real viable option in that sort of thing. Particularly when the cost of supply, of, um, of running the cars is so much slower as well. Um, so I've sort of already touched on this, but I guess this was just sort of drawing out, you know, that change in the household. So the one on the left there looks like a house that you would probably see. Um, actually, looks like my house, um, like in West End sort of thing on the side of Castle Hill. Although well, there's smokestacks in the back there, so I'm not sure where they come from. But um, you can imagine the one on the right there is basically what a house would look like today already anyway, you know, with the, the PVs on the roof and that. Um, but also now we're getting battery systems. In Queensland we have something, you know, the, the biggest challenge in the past was just people taking up air conditioners and all the extra load and like, come on. But we're sort of reaching saturation of air, air conditioners now. I think our latest advice was that 90% of houses in Queensland now have an air conditioner and I think it's something like three and a half air conditioners per house. Obviously Townsville would be one of the higher end where we have an air conditioner per bedroom plus lounge room and all that as well. Um, but even places like Toowoomba where it's, and Stanthorpe and that where it's much colder still are getting two or three air conditioners per house. So um, it just again that's sort of another one where it's changed the, the behaviours but you know now we're seeing solar hot water systems on the roof. Um, Electric vehicles in the driveway is the other sort of, I guess, next sort of merge from that. Um, but also the smarts coming into the house. So there's a device called the um, the Ness uh, thermostat, and Google paid. Um, I can't remember how much it was now, but it was a you know a, a fairly sizable amount. Um, I want to say somewhere in the order of about 300 million or something for this company, and it's just a thermostat. Like you, you know, there's nothing sexy about a thermostat. Um, but what this has done is it has the ability, to, it's basically just putting a bit of smart into the device where you would otherwise just set your temperature and walk away. The device starts to you know, think about what sort of temperature do you want in the morning, when are you waking up, when are you going to work, when are you coming home, what temperature do you want at those different times of the day, how many people are in the house and how does that affect the, the uh, heating and cooling of the house and that as well. So it starts to, without you having to do anything, basically you know, within the first week it's learning all your habits and your behaviours um, and then just manages your, your um, you're heating and cooling from then, that point onwards, and so it suddenly becomes this distant thing that you never actually think about anymore, um, and improves your, you know, your energy usage. But at the same time, it also is monitored through the internet back to a control center, um, and it also has the ability, if there was some sort of, you know, network issue or something like that, um, that they could switch off all those systems or bring them down by 50% or something like that for 15 minutes and maybe we do one customer and then the next customer and the next one and then cycle through. So you as a customer don't notice but you're getting maybe a check in the mail for $50 because you participated in this program or something. But it's, it has the ability to sort of manage the energy usage within your household um, for the benefit of the network but also for the benefit of the customer by getting some sort of rebate. And I guess just, you know, just looking at that bottom picture, so this is taken from Townsville with the, um, uh, the Energy Sense Communities Program. Um, but, you know, there was all sorts of abilities that were now adding in there, so the ability to monitor and know exactly what's going on in the electricity network, that the able to switch in real time and that sort of thing, so you can limit the amount of, of um, network, you know, the uh, amount of network that's um, isolated in the event of a fault or something like that. Um, and I guess the next step that we're now working on is then the ability to, so if you do lose like a main, uh, main power line coming in because of a cyclone or something, the ability to have a community to be its own self-sufficient network and to even connect the rest of the network back up to us. So that's having the ability to have your generation that's already there, so your solar PV, um, the, the battery storage to have supply through the night time. Um, it's got its own regulation and smarts within the network. Um, so you can keep those customers on supply and that as well. Um, until you can connect the main network up, and so that's called a, a, a microgrid. Um, so there's a lot of work in this space to sort of see how the topology of the network is changing and how you meet the sort of changing needs of customers and that as well.
Um, and so, I guess just touching on that microgrid, that's sort of, I guess, the space that, you know, like is a big part of it now too. And so, as with everything, sort of the, the leaders in these sort of things is the, uh, the Defence Force. So, the US uh, Defence Force realised that of all their bases they have in the world, um, and they have a lot, um, they actually couldn't supply the electricity within the base if the, you know, the opposition was to knock out the power line going into the base. They couldn't supply any energy from the, uh, the base themselves. They had a bit of diesel generation, but obviously that's quite limited. Um, so that obviously represents a massive strategic um, issue. Um, so now they they're spending you know, a colossal amount of money in terms of being able to make these, these bases be able to stand on their own two feet for you know, forever, essentially. But obviously that's not their standard operating model. But if, if there was a need and someone did have a power on the bases, operating, they can still be strategic, they can still defend or attack whatever area the US is operating in at the time. Um, so there's you know a lot of opportunities with that. But the US is actually now taking that an extra step. So they, I don't know if many people will remember there was a, a hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, that hit the east coast of the US in 2000 and, uh, at the end of 2012. And um, it was about the equivalent of a Category 3 cyclone. Um, so a little bit bigger than Marcia that hit Rocky uh, or Ukraine. Um, but in, um, you know, we're talking about sort of four times the population of Australia living within this area that was affected. Also very flat, very low sea level. Um, and also New York being you know, three times the economy of Australia essentially in that one little city, in that one Manhattan Island. So a very exposed financially in the economic area. Um, and caused a massive amount of damage to it. And the electricity companies, but also all of the, you know, the fire brigade and all that sort of stuff, just really wasn't prepared. And they, they really struggled to get the power back on. Um, and there was a lot of lives that were lost in that um, because of the time of year it was too, in terms of being cold and all that too, but not being able to get food and water and all those things through. So then those, a lot of those states along there are spending a colossal amount of money in terms of saying, how do we make these areas more resilient? And there's a number of things they're doing, but one big part of that is that electricity network and how you can still get pockets that can keep on supplying themselves and keep on managing their grid, even when you know the upstream network is lost um, or being you know completely destroyed you know, because of a, a cyclone or a hurricane. Um, and the next sort of big one is, I guess, there's a building in in London called the Shard. It's uh, it basically looks like the Aria Award. Um, it's just a big sort of um, yeah triangular prism, I guess. Um, but it, in itself, it is the equivalent of a suburb in one building. There's um, commercial space at the bottom, and there's a massive amount of business um, within the middle, and then there's a heap of residential, and then business at the top again. Um, but they have their own shopping centres, they have their own you know, cinema. Um, I can't remember the, how many people live and work within the building. Um, but I guess it's a big deal for the for the Europe because they don't have too many high-rise buildings in Europe. Um, but this in itself is a you know is a massive building, and it and it has you know, it'd be the equivalent of taking all of, um, all of, say, West End in Townsville and putting that into one building, I guess, sort of thing. Um, but in themselves, you know, so they had now trying to work out, you know, you, you go from a basic building management system that, um, that JCU would have in this building or the hospital would have in their building, and you try to turn that into a, um, a building for, uh, for this kind of scale. And it goes from being just a building management system to actually being its own power network, its own telecommunications network, its own gas network, its own you know water network and all that sort of stuff and having reticulation and all those sort of things and being able to efficiently manage that within a building. Um, so it starts to present a whole heap of new challenges and that sort of thing. But it also shows, you know, the sort of, I guess, boldness that um, that we as, you know, as a society are taking and the sort of the opportunities that lie ahead over the next sort of 10, 20 years as well. Um, and I guess this moves me, you know, to the sort of, I guess, that emerging picture, I guess, is this, is this smart city or smart world. So there's a heap of boxes on there, it's probably really hard to see on this slide, but essentially we've got all of this infrastructure that's existed and unchanged for, you know, several decades or hundreds of years, depending on what it is. But there's even those pieces in themselves, and I think that's the bit I've probably uh, rambled on about a few times, is that uh, the ability to bring the smarts into those systems. So. We start having things like smart roads, so you've got you know your CCTV and all that sort of stuff that are on the roads, but they start to monitor the flow of the traffic and that as well, and they start to manage um, automatically. Start to manage you know when the lights are changing and all that sort of stuff, so they can help manage the flow of electricity around. There might have been an accident on you know a main street, and they need to make sure they can start to divert people 
around in certain areas, you know, signs spring up and start, or automatically spring up and start telling, you know, that there's an incident, you need to divert to this way and that as well. Um, you can start to manage, you know, your, um, your emergency system, so your fire and police and ambulance and that sort of thing, so you can dispatch them quicker and get them the quickest route, but you can also divert the traffic around them to go in different directions. Um, you've got, uh, I guess, um, you know, the healthcare system and that sort of thing, so if you have a disaster, but even just in normal operating models and as well, you know, in terms of being able to um, understand which way you want to send the different types of patients and different patient flows to manage, um, you know, what the resources that are available and that sort of thing. Um, particularly, yeah, but particularly when you have a disaster. So one of the challenges, say, with the earthquake in Nepal really recently was that, you know, you had Kathmandu City here with some, some basic government hospitals and some private hospitals. And um, one of the initial challenges they had is that each of the hospitals were operating independently. There was no real communications between them, and so one hospital was functioning quite fine, and you know was able to meet up with the workload. They had um, a ton of ice, so they could, you know, as sadly as well, like people passing away, they could put them into these reserves and still store them until they, could get, you know, get them to um to be cremated and that. But other places were were not coping. You know, they had people and triage and going out into the street, and out into these you know, grass areas and that sort of thing, um, and trying to manage all that. They didn't have you know doctors and all that sort of stuff to numbers. Um, but a complete breakdown of the communication in those sort of systems and that meant that you know they couldn't properly manage um, the patient care and, and the people transfers between those centres as well. Um, so they still had ambulances rocking up to already busy hospitals instead of taking them to places that could have managed them. Um, and these are the sort of, I guess, the opportunities that lie for you know engineering in general, but electrical engineering, um, and particularly you know like the telecommunications and that as well, is the ability to introduce the smarts into all of these challenges. And it goes from being just a technical or an engineering type problem, or rather say just a technical problem, to a full engineering problem or a systems problem where you've got you know, different types of technologies, different um, specialisations, but very even different types of end users and, and social interaction with that. And obviously you have to factor all of those sort of things in, in order for the system to be functional and to, you know, to be as efficient as what you're trying to achieve. Um, so that in itself is, I guess, you know, um, a big change within the, the industry in that which you know, has existed in other parts of engineering but now it's more, the expectation is for it to exist across the whole breadth of the, um, the profession is the ability to factor in the end user and how that, you know, those people actually interact with it as well as opposed to thinking about just the, uh, the technical side. So I think, yeah, I think that's everything I had. Um, I guess I just wanted to finish, you know, from a student's perspective, you know, sitting there, um, you know, what are the opportunities if you were to go into the electrical engineering space or, and, and actually this applies equally across all of the engineering professions. Um, it's the variety that you have on offer. You know, just even within the electrical space, there are so many different fields and so many different areas you can be pulled into um, or, or go after. Um, but it, when you look at the whole engineering sort of um, uh, profession, there are so many different places and opportunities for you to work in Australia, around the world, um, and even though if you look at what's changed in the last 50 years, you know, think about all the different ways it's going to change over the next 50 years and the opportunity that lies for you there. Um, and you have the opportunity to be looking forward to be sort of seeing what, you know, how the space is going to change and sort of, you know, um, see what society and, and different technologies and all that have in store for us, um, you know, one, two, three, 50 years out sort of thing. Um, and I guess the, the probably the big thing that already draws people into the engineering profession but you have the opportunity to keep on going with is, is that challenging or that opportunity to be a problem solver. And you know, you can be very much if you want, you can be completely focused on technical, you can be completely focused on the discipline, or you can be a cross discipline, you know, um, problem solver, or you can be trying to factor in, you know, uh, technical with regal, uh, sorry, regulatory, legal, um, social, um, you know, health and safety, um, financial and trying to factor all those sort of things in and the technical element becoming smaller and that, but still trying to do all that sort of problem solving. Um, and I guess, you know, as a profession and all the industries and companies and that sort of thing that we work for, ultimately we have the opportunity to provide a service to, uh, to society, whether that's through, you know, transportation, health, um, agriculture, um, electricity, um, or, you know, minerals and resources and that as well, uh, as well as, you know, um, electronics and, and um, uh, and the products and all that we use. So I think that's, yeah, that's all I had. Um, 
And so yeah, I welcome any questions or any comments or anything that anyone would like to make. Uh, and I'm happy to stay back for a couple minutes or so if uh, anyone wants to approach me separately. Covered a lot of the things we were talking about during the semester about grand challenges for engineering and things like that. You can see it's a it's a huge um, area. The the smart grids, smart devices, things like that, and electrical engineering is squarely placed in that. No questions. Everyone's going to go and get their get their submission for today together. Cool. Um, I've got a question. So uh, you mentioned the the Tesla battery pack for houses. Um, do you want to comment any further on on how soon do you think that's going to hit Australian shores and is it going to make as big a difference as it feels like it will? Um, like so next year it'll be within Australia. They, they actually, Tesla said that Australia will be their second largest market. Yeah. Um, which is pretty big considering that you know we only have 24 million versus 300 million in, in uh, America. Yeah. Um, but because we have such a massive solar uptake and people are very conscious about it and we have a higher disposal income than a lot of other nations, um, they see that, yeah, that, that's the market. In terms of what difference it makes, um, it doesn't really change any of the cost or the technology or any of those things, but it's, I guess, the market and the way that they sell it and all those sorts yeah. of stuff. And I think that's the next step. And definitely, like, the state governments at least um, are all looking at how they leverage up backwards now as well, yeah. which is a big challenge because now we've got to get all the safety things all sorted out, which don't currently exist. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm. Any, any other questions? In Australia versus, yeah, so um, there's a couple of things, like in the countries that have had a takeoff, um, coincidentally are all car manufacturing nations, so the US, Japan, um, China and Europe, um, and then you do have some very liberal sort of countries or states that do as well, but generally they're, they're car manufacturing nations, so the governments have had a direct reason why they want electric vehicles to take off, because that's the next product to sell, and they make a lot of money from taxes, um, both from the car manufacturers, but also from people buying vehicles. Now. So when you look in the US, the specific states that are doing the most are often the ones that are car manufacturers, but then you have the more liberal leaning um, states and nations in that as well, like California, um, you know, like Denmark, and, and um, sort of the Northern, Euro um, Northern European countries in that as well. Um, so obviously they do it for more, a bit more from a social agenda in that as well. Um, but within Australia, obviously we don't manufacture, or well, we're, we're about to stop manufacturing cars. Um, and we probably have had, uh, we've had some small programs and some small government state-based ones. But the cost of the vehicles, because they're important and the taxes and duties put on, still makes them very expensive in comparison within Australia. Um, but a lot of those things are breaking down. But ultimately, I guess the government appetite, like so the current federal government doesn't have any appetite towards EVs, but you know, if we went back, Two, government, two federal governments and two state governments ago, at least in Queensland, there was a bit more of an appetite and they had drivers for it. But yeah, at the end of the day, consumers aren't pushing for it either. Um, but then that's how often you see one for sale in the car yards and that sort of thing. So yeah, it, I think it'll change, but it's going to be a lot slower to take up. And we're probably looking at about the next 10 years being quite slow. Um, but then it'll be quite rapid after that. Um, but yeah, there's already would make financial sense, you just have to have the upfront capital to be able to buy a car of that cost, I guess. Company. Um, Tesla's about the only EV company left. All of the ones that started in the US have all gone bust. Um, so the, it's really the incumbents like, you know, Toyota, um, Honda, uh, Mitsubishi, uh, Ford, uh, that are all of the young um, Chrysler, I'm uh, sorry, and GM are the ones that are all, you know, really, they have the money there to manage it and to sink it, but they also they have a lot to lose by not progressing with it. But being an EV specific company would be very, is, a, is a very challenging because there's a lot of money to go in it. That said though, uh, there's a company out of Brisbane called Tridium that makes the, um, the fast charging stations, so they charge an EV within 10 minutes um, from 0 to 80%. Um, and they're actually one of the leading um, fast charging stations in the world. They're far smaller, 
um, and uh, stand up to be honest because they're designed in Australia, then a lot of the other ones have been far more affordable. Um, so they're, while they're not getting any contracts really in Australia, apart from the Q and St. Louis and that sort of area, they're getting big contracts for Europe and the US. Uh, and that was a Queensland born and designed product in that So those sort of, like again, going back to the niche opportunities, that's where I think Australia's opportunities do lie going forward. Any other questions? Um, what was your favourite country to do your favourite program? Favourite country to say? Why? Oh, um, so when I was doing the scholarship, yeah, the, my favourite... Um, I liked working in the US actually because they're quite bold um, and they, um, they have a different way of looking at things and they're very uh, optimistic about a lot of stuff but they're quite aggressive in that with what they want to do and you know, they've got that big country, you know, world superpower sort of mentality and that, so it's, it's a little bit exciting to see what they think and do and the risks they take. Um, Are they leading to sustainability? Um, they have elements of sustainability, but at the same time, if they put a dollar into sustainability, they're probably putting two dollars into something else anyway. So they have, you know, probably just as many, or far more social and all those sort of problems than what we would here, but... Um, they definitely are doing more in that space than that though. But as a, I guess as a comparison, they consider um, PV uh, penetration within an area of 2% to be high, whereas in Queensland we're sitting at 20% now. So we actually have the, after Germany, we have the highest uptake of solar PV in the world. And yet, you know, when you talk to people, they say, we should be doing more, like we're not doing much, we're falling behind the rest of the world. But actually we are quite a leader in those spaces. We just don't, we just don't have the appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Carnegie that's going out of Western Australia is probably the most advanced in the world for their um, their uh, wave energy. Um, there's been a lot of different ones. Where there's at least three main companies in Australia, but they all do completely different technologies. Like one was like a snake. Um, Carnegie's is like a ball that like moves, and I think Cameron Bellum is more like. Um, shark fins or something that moved backwards and forwards, they were completely different. Um, but, and there's a few different developments in the world, but Carnegie would be, in Western Australia, would be definitely the leader in the world. Um, the issue is just like, you need a lot of them to get a lot of energy and that sort of stuff, and then you need them close to the resource where you're going to use them, because obviously you have losses and that sort of stuff. Um, and actually, I went to do a tour of Carnegie two years ago, and the day we went to tour, they had a massive tidal surge, and it flooded all of their control centre, and they had to, you know, cost them Hundred grand, hundred euros for refurbishment and all that sort of stuff. So there is still challenges in that for those, you know, extreme weather events and that, that we get to. So, yeah. But yeah, it, it's a piece of the puzzle. All of these sort of ones, it goes from just being just coal plus gas on top to being a far bigger, you know, mix and that sort of thing. They all form little pieces of the puzzle. Anyone else? Excellent. All right. Well, let's thank John again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. slash DVDs, etc. Uh, at the tooth this afternoon and I'll see you all then.